The following presentation is a production of Ride the Wave Media. Hello, witches and wizards. Welcome to Practically Magic. This is Courtney Pearl, pagan witch, card reader, healer, spiritualist, Celtic priestess, teacher, artist, and mystic seeker. I have been discovering the true and real magic, and I wish to share it with you, with the world. We're going to start today's episode by pulling a card. Today's episode is going to be about cycles and the pagan wheel of the year and cycles of healing. So I'm calling it the wheel of the year episode, and I am going to pull a card from the Gaia Oracle deck that I have just received. I know I... I've been saying that a lot. I have a new deck. The truth is I have been getting a lot of new decks lately. And I do have my own little cleansing ritual when I have a new deck to play with or to use for divination purposes, especially for my tarot decks, which I uh, hold in high regard. So if you receive a new deck that you are playing with, it's a good idea to do your own cleansing rituals, cleanse it of all of the past energy that it's interacted with, and to find a way, I use Reiki to cleanse it. Sometimes with my tarot decks, I really want to get a personal imprint of my energy with the cards. And so I will actually put them under my pillow and sleep with them for a little while. Lucky, lucky tarot decks that get to sleep with me. Yeah, for today's episode, I'm pulling from the Gaia deck because it, it symbolizes Gaia is like the goddess of Mother Earth energy. And so I think because we're talking about the wheel of the earth and natural cycles, Gaia is a perfect symbolism to incorporate into our episode today. The card that I have pulled is the evolution card. So it says here on the card, earth changes, climate change, transformation. That's been coming up a lot since January. Transformation. We're in a time of transformation. The imagery on this card is it's the sun with a very faint silhouette of a landscape, maybe trees or mountains. It's not very clear what the silhouette is because it's like the silhouette. It's it's the shadow. And it's interesting because there are there's one sun, one bright sun, and then there's two reflections of that sun. So three orbs of light total in this image. And it kind of looks like when you're looking at a sunset, but you don't want to look directly at the sun. So you squint your eyes and in your squinting eyes, you can kind of see the reflection or the like image of the sun in your eyes. And so there's it looks like there's three suns instead of one. And it's interesting because the second one, the middle one, looks as though it is surrounded by a ring of spirals in this image. And I love that because what we're going to be talking about today has a lot to do with cycles. And in the Celtic symbology, that is often represented as spirals. You will see a lot of spirals in Celtic art, Celtic symbolism, and spirals are very personal to a sort of Celtic healing tradition because it helps to represent the idea that we are not on a linear line. We like to think we are. We like to think of us time as linear. We like to think of us as moving constantly forward in our lives. Like we leave the past behind us. We're in the present. And then there's this line ahead of us that we're on, this trajectory that we're on, this path. But the truth is our paths are much more cyclical and look more like a spiral than anything else because you are going to constantly run into patterns in your life. You are going to constantly see how patterns play a part in who you are and how you deal with life. And a lot of times we do feel like we are back in the same position we were already in at another point in time. People often see this when they're in relationships, when they're looking for love. They'll see that like the relationships that they are having constantly seem to navigate similarly. A lot of people are trying to break out of patterns because they're toxic or sabotaging and they're not congruent with what they really want. These cycles and patterns are incredibly powerful. 
And it goes really perfectly with the theme of this card, which is evolution. We cannot evolve without those cycles. We cannot see our patterns without the pattern. Patterns repeat themselves. But the good news is you're never in the exact same place again. So even though you feel like you're in the same place, like you've gone through this cycle before and maybe it's like, oh, I'm at this point in a relationship and now it feels just like past relationships. Why do I keep doing this? Why do I keep finding partners that do the same things or treat me the same way when I'm trying to find something different? And the truth is that happens so that you can look at that and reflect on that. But you're never in the exact same place again. Because truthfully, it spirals upward or spirals downward. You're never in the exact same place. So if you're raising your vibration, you are spiraling up. It's kind of like leveling up. If you want to see it that way, it's like you're hovering over the same place you were in before, but you're not in the same place you were before. You're hovering over it. You're looking at it from now a completely new perspective. Hopefully that's a higher perspective, a I've been here before and I know exactly what this is. I know exactly what I'm doing rather than, oh, here we go again. I'm totally lost and confused and I have no idea what to do. But if it's not a trajectory upward, it might be a trajectory downward. And then it's another opportunity for you to see that, wow, what I'm doing is clearly not working. I am not evolving the way I should or want to. So even that is a good thing. Even that can be spun to see it as, wow, this is an invitation. This is an invitation for change. I need something different. I need something new. And if you're in that kind of position in life, you feel like there's patterns you are just stuck in and you just do not feel like you can break forward, I'm going to highly recommend emotional processing because it is one of my favorite modalities for helping people to get unstuck and to realize what really is the deeper invitation going on. And that card is so perfectly aligned with what we're going to talk about today because cycles are so important in healing work, in magic work, in whatever work you're doing. When it comes to self-work, you cannot ignore cycles. And today I want to talk a little bit about cycles and the pagan wheel of the year, but I'm going to talk about it in the sense of healing cycles, in self-awareness cycles, because We have come from a tradition that, I mean, no, for myself, coming from a Mormon background, which is just a branch of Christianity, which is fairly new to the earth. If you're looking at the timeline of the entire earth and the entire existence of human beings, even Christianity is fairly new. And it's not just Christianity, but like patriarchal belief systems, such as the Zeus or Ra in Egypt, Zeus in in Greek. These are patriarchal societies. And in that come from, there is a very masculine come from. And that sort of tends to reiterate to us humans that we are separate or different or maybe even above all of the natural things of the world. And it separates us from the natural. So, for example, well, let's just look at how the past few hundred years has affected Turtle Island, America, North America that I live on here. We call it Turtle Island because that is comes from a mythology and folklore of the indigenous people on this land. And, you know, just looking at how people from Northern Europe have come to this land and sort of treated it like they had a claim to it, a God-given right to use it however they will and see ourselves as different or sort of superior to the natural cycles of it. Like trees are just objects or, you know, the seasons come and go, but we are the same. We are above all that. We continue to go to work and do what we do every single day. And the more I thought about the subject of cycles and the more I thought about the pagan wheel of the year, which I'm going to talk about, the more I thought about how we distance ourselves from the natural, that even within our own bodies, have we really been in tune with the natural cycles of what we are 
doing or what we need or how we thrive? And how did we get so far in our mentality of how we interact with that that we think we're not affected by cycles, that we are like, yeah, 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 seasons come and go, but like, I still have to go to work. I still have to go to school. I still have to get up every day at the same time. I mean, we have separated ourselves so much that we think we are not affected by those cycles. We're just like, I'm going to just live my life. And the truth is separating ourselves from that has done us a world disservice. And I'm going to invite everybody listening to welcome cycles back into your life. Whether that means the seasons, whether that means the cycles of the moon, the monthly cycles, or whether that means just tracking your own personal cycles of when you feel at your most productive and when you are in need of rest. Because just being aware of your cycles or where your cycles might be off is going to give you so much insight and healing into yourself that you will be transformed. It will be like a new life. And so I'm going to talk about it in terms of the wheel of the year. So whether you're a pagan or not, it doesn't matter because as I always say on my show, these are things that help you live a magical life. And I happen to resonate very deeply with the wheel of the year because it helps me understand what the ancient peoples before we considered ourselves separate from the earth and the and the seasons and the and the kin of the animals and plants when we considered ourselves part of all of that part of that web and interconnection between all living things this is what our bodies would naturally want to do is be a part of that. So that is where the pagan wheel of the year comes from. And it marks these holy days, which I think is much more productive to us than, let's say, getting a dart and throwing it at a calendar and then being like, that's the day we're going to celebrate love. You know, I'm not sure the historical implications of like St. Valentine's Day or St. Patrick's Day or these other holidays that we tend to celebrate in our culture now. But I think some of them do coincide with the ancient holy days. And I think some of them are, again, sort of random. So hear me out. We're going to go through the wheel of the year. Today, on the day that this podcast is going to be released, I hope, if I've planned it all out right, is actually the first day of spring which we sort of mark those in our lives in in the more modern culture. We kind of just tend to go, oh, cool, it's the first day of spring. That's nice. And then move on. But in the pagan wheel of the year, these are very holy days. These are very uh, significant days to the clan, to the community, to the culture, to what's going on in our lives. Um, even if some of the things that they did in ancient times, we don't necessarily have to worry about. They still need to be um, respected. So we have the first day of spring, but actually the pagan wheel of the year starts on November 1st. So we're starting actually with Samhain, which is November 1st. And I'm going to kind of integrate some story time into this as we talk about it. So I have, I know in our podcast episode last week, I talked about Ostara, which is where the term Easter comes from and rebirth. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But Samhain starts in, in Welsh, it's Kalengef. I may, I might not be pronouncing that exactly right, but uh, I'm trying. I'm trying. I've been learning Welsh for quite a while now, but I'm not very fluent. I'm not good at it. So I'm just trying to pronounce it correctly. Samhain is November 1st, it's kind of where Halloween comes from. Um, October 31st is celebrated um, as Halloween. But Samhain is the third of three harvest holidays. So it starts a new year. It's the year when the last of the vegetables and fruits are harvested. And in especially in a Celtic tradition, it is one of the in-betweens. It's not an equinox and it's not a solstice. So it's not a sun or solar 
holiday or holy day, but it is significant because in the Celtic tradition and maybe maybe many other traditions around the world, but I know from my studies, Celtic tradition, it is significant to honor the in-between stages. So it's not a solstice or an equinox, but it's in between those. And we understand in between spaces to be very sacred because it's like the veil thins between our world and other worlds. The Fey world, the other world, Anuvin, or even the world of the spirits, where we go after we die. So those those are the reasons why that that Halloween is considered to be like a thin space. So there's a lot more spookiness and hauntings in that time. But it's actually a very sacred holiday. It's not just a day for spooky things, demons and witches. So we move into, from Samhain, we're moving into then the winter solstice, which is December 21st, 22nd. And obviously it is probably historically the reason why Christians decided to celebrate Christ's birth at that point in time. Because historically, pagans and indigenous cultures before Christianity all over the world were already celebrating the longest night of the year. That was a year that they would mark as a day of the darkest or darkness or going, sending into darkness. And then that is the day when they celebrate the return of the light. So a lot of solar symbols like circles, spirals, the Yule log. These are symbols that you will see are even pre-Christian. The Christmas tree, for the most part, is still much more pagan than it is Christian. <laughs> I know that we love to take symbols of the that were already there during that time of the year and Christianity has sort of liked to, oh, well, actually, you know, the candy cane is the shepherd hook, and it means the shepherds that came to see Christ when he was born, blah, blah, blah. So we like to, like, manipulate those symbols and try to make them as Christian as possible. But the truth is, a lot of them were pre-Christian. A lot of them were pagan in, in origin. Inviting a tree into your home and decorating it, that is definitely pagan centered <laughs> has to do with honoring the trees that stay green throughout the winter and and even dispelling spirits that come in the darkness things like that the wreath making a circle out of those greenery was a symbol of the sun and it was a again an invitation to bring the sun back so before maybe the early peoples of the earth were a little concerned when the darkness came that the light wouldn't come back. So they came up with ceremony and ritual and practices that would be inviting the sun back at Yule time. So from Yule, we go into, into spring and we have Imbolc. Imbolc is the holiday that's celebrated on February 1st. It's in between the solstice and the equinox. So it is, for a lot of traditions, it is the beginning of spring even though it isn't technically spring equinox yet, a lot of those traditions would start to celebrate the return of spring. This is when we start to talk about the sun returning and the wildlife returning to life and the buds growing and the full moon of that season is called the moon of germination because we're germinating the seeds. Either they're allowing seeds to start in their homes inside, indoors, or you might be planting bulbs in the earth before it has completely thawed to get ready for spring. So that is the time of St. Bridget or the goddess Bridget. There is a lot of traditions and folklore that happen at, to mark that holy day and occasion. And then we move into the spring equinox, obviously Ostera. So happy Ostera today, if you're listening on March 19th, because that is supposedly the first day of spring in 2024. And we're going to talk a little about the traditions that happen at this time of year. But we're actually marking the halfway point, meaning that the daylight and the dark are equal. That's why it's called equinox. And these are marking the occasions in the Northern Hemisphere. So if you're listening in the summer, Southern Hemisphere, I know a lot of these are going to be opposites of the dates. But stick with me because it's just opposite. 
we move from Ostera into Beltane, which is May 1st or May Day. And a lot of the Northern European traditions of this day are still intact. You can go and maybe people don't always realize where they or originated, but Beltane is mentioned a lot in texts because it's sort of fertility rites. It's like maybe the ancient pagans, they had certain fertility ceremonies or rituals that had to do with engaging in activities that would produce babies. And the maypole comes from these traditions. So the maypole is a phallic symbol with flowers bursting from the top. So if you didn't recognize that that was a fertility symbol and that we're dancing around the phallic symbol, well, that is what it is. It's just where it, where it originated. It was basically a blessing. So the horned god would marry the May Queen. There would be fertility rites happening. There'd be sacred marriages, the sacred marriage between the king and the land. This is when all that symbology is happening. And it is a cleansing a lot of bonfires are lit and they would make they would bring the cows and sheep from one field or pasture or from their indoor enclosures their stables and they would bring them out into the herds out into the pastures so this is when they bring them out into the fields and they pass them through the bonfire so that they're cleansed with smoke and this is a spiritual cleansing and it's also a practical cleansing because the smoke would kind of cleanse the parasites off of them and whatever, you know, might be living in their fur. So all of this is happening at Beltane, May Day, welcoming spring, welcoming warm weather, welcoming sun. And then we move into summer solstice, which is, again, the longest day of the year. This is when we celebrate the, the sun. And this also marks the, so a lot of those are the planting seasons. When we go from Imbolc to Ara and then into Beltane. These are planting seasons. We're planting seeds. We're planting crops. We're we're bringing our livestock out into the fields. And these mark those occasions because that was really important to indigenous peoples all over the world. These are occasions that need to be marked because it our survival of our village, of our clan, actually depends on that. So they're marking these occasions because they're actually offering these things up to their gods, to their deities, and saying, please bless the land, make it abundant, make it fertile so that our village can live another year. And then after summer solstice, we go into, which is Lunesta or La- Lamas, La- Lamas. I'm not sure if I'm saying that totally correctly. So if you are indigenous, like, Celtic, Ireland, and Scotland. You you can correct me on how I'm pronouncing that. Then we move into August 1st, which is Mabon. Now, it's not originally called Mabon. That was actually a pretty new term. And there's a lot of Welsh mythology that comes with the story of Mabon. And Mabon has nothing to do with August 1st or that holiday. That was more of a, like, the founder of the Wiccan religion kind of gave it that name. So, There's some debate on whether or not it should be called that, but otherwise it doesn't have a name. So I prefer to just go ahead and call it that. Mabon is August 1st, and that marks the first. Actually, the summer solstice starts the first harvesting season. So there are three harvesting holy days, and that is when we start to harvest. So in the summer, we're harvesting berries, we're harvesting peas, we're harvesting all of those fruits and vegetables that come into season at that time of the year. And then August 1st, we're starting to harvest the apples, the apricots and peaches. They start to, you know, come into season during that time at the end of summer. And then we come back into Samhain again, and we have gone through the full wheel. Now, what this means for us is that if we do not pay attention to those markings or just marking the seasons as we go through them, our bodies are already responding to those natural cycles. We've all heard of the seasonal affective depression disorder where you you get depressed during winter. And that might sound like a terrible thing, like an affliction that you get during winter. But actually what is do, what is happening is your body is responding to the natural cycles of hibernation in winter. 
And I like to refer to the word depressed as deep rest. Basically, you need that rest. Everybody does. We need hibernation. We need moments. And whether it comes with the seasons or it comes with the cycles of our lives, it might be daily, it might be monthly, but to be able to understand that our bodies naturally need moments of rest when we're not as productive and we're just living off of the harvest of our more productive season, that is a natural cycle. I love there was research done with trees. I was watching and reading about this where they were injecting certain hormones into trees, like certain chemicals that make the trees continue productivity, continue their growth season. Something like steroids for trees. I'm not exactly sure. But the research was showing that can they force trees that are many hundreds of years old um, and go through their own growing seasons? That's what makes the rings in the tree trunks, right? We, we cut a tree and we can see the rings. Well, that's because there are seasons of growth and there are seasons of rest. And they were injecting these trees just to see if they could get the trees to continue their growth instead of stopping and resting. Well, the trees died because they figured out that the trees actually needed that rest. It's part of their natural cycle. It's part of what they need. So if constant productivity and expecting ourselves and each other and our entire society to be constantly in productivity mode does not seem entirely fair. If we're not honoring our cycles, we are, and we're not wintering, we're not allowing ourselves the moments of winter to happen where it's like, I am not going to I'm going to permit myself to not require anything to be done. For this amount of time, I'm going to just rest. I'm going to do nothing. I'm going to winter. Then we're essentially offering ourselves up to being sick, allowing disease. And I use that word meaning disease as an illness and disease meaning dis-ease. We are allowing that to happen. And that is why we get more sick. Our immune system is compromised. We cannot function properly when we are just in productivity mode all the time. That's kind of like not allowing the balance of life. So I'm going to do an episode on masculine and feminine energy and balancing those. And that's going to come into play a lot when it comes to that. But I just want to leave you with the idea that cycling is something you need to be aware of. Women tend to cycle with the moon. And I wish someone had told me that and explained it to me that way when I was a young girl looking at starting my own cycles. I saw cycles, I saw starting my womanhood and the the kinds of natural things that happen during that time, I saw it as a curse. And that's because most women do see it as a curse. It was called a curse for a long time. And wasn't until I was in my 30s that a naturopathic doctor offered me hormone therapy and said, you know, I would like you to time your hormone therapy based on the phases of the moon. I want you to do these hormones during this time and these hormones during this time. And I want you to track when is the dark moon and when is the full moon. And that was the first time in my entire life I had ever been told that. And I thought, how sad is it that we're going through our life expecting ourselves to just pretend like every day is exactly the same, that we're required to get up and do the same amount of work every single day. And last year, I met a woman who who does these amazing holding space workshops, and she said, I purposely track my cycle to know when my time is coming and to plan a couple of days off. She owns her own business. She runs her own business. So she's able to do that probably more easily. But she purposely says, I am going to purposely do less on those days, not plan any special outings, not plan play dates, not plan work appointments, things like that, workshops, whatever. I'm not going to plan any of it during those three days because I want to spend most of my time in bed reading 
or taking care of myself or resting because that is what her cycle needs. I have been studying the Avalonian cycles of healing and in in the Mythic Moon of Avalon book, she talks about marking each full moon with the mythology of the five goddesses in the wealth in the Welsh mythology. And she says in February, that's the full moon of germination. You're germinating your intentions for the year. And then we are moving into what is going to be the moon of evocation. So she says, and I'm quoting from the book, a calling forth of new beginnings from out of slowly weakening entanglements of shadow. And this is in the Mythic Moons of Avalon. I will resource this at the end and I will also post that in my blog so you know where to find that information. And I love how she explains the Avalonian cycles of healing, which I now use when I am doing an IPT process or a session with someone, because even an emotional process session is going to go through an entire cycle. We're going through the cycle of emergence. We're going into the cauldron, into the darkness of our heart, into our bodies, figuring out what it is that is stuck there. So we're going through a confrontation stage and then we're kind going to emerge from that stage into kind of the working it into our new lives. So you have to go through that entire cycle in order to come out the other side and know exactly what it is you need. And being stuck or having stuck energy, like I was saying about cycles before, that is just an invitation to look into that deeper. And there is real magic in being able to address what cycle am I in right now? Am I in a cycle of transformation? Am I am I in a cycle of confrontation? Am I in a moment where I'm really at battle with myself? Or am I doing really well because I just came out of that cycle, so now I'm using and utilizing new ideas into my life? All right. So we've talked a little bit about those traditions and the cycles of the year and cycles of healing. What I did do today is I skipped story time, and I just want to go through a couple of stories that have to do with the first of the year, the first, the spring of the year, because today is spring. I want to mark this occasion. One of my favorite stories, and this comes from No Country for Old Women, and it's the story of the Kaliach in Scotland. This is kind of an origin story, and I won't read it. I'm just going to kind of paraphrase it. I'm going to just summarize it real quick for you. But if you ever get a hold of this story in the way that it's written in this book, it's absolutely beautiful with imagery. So please read it if you have the time. And it's the story about how um, on a Beltane morning, the Kaliath is an old woman. She has creaky bones, and she's starting to, to get to a point where Um, She always goes to the well of youth and drinks from the water and dips into the lake. And when she dips into the lake, she always is renewed young again. And this is how the mythology goes. But in this story, she's actually questioning it. She's wondering if she should do that or if she should just let herself die. Because in this new world, in this new age, she has become kind of powerless, powerless against humans and the atrocities that they have they have put upon the earth. And she can no longer have the energy to continue making the earth and making it what it is because she's just she's just so tired. So she's contemplating just giving up, letting her life end. And as she's as she's doing this, she's thinking, she's hearing the dog barking, and she knows if she does not get to the lake by the time the dog starts barking or the dog is there, then she won't, she'll run out of time. She won't make it. So she has to make this decision. And she starts making her way down the hill, down the forest to the lake. And she notices at some point in this journey, she notices a fox on the ground, and the fox has died. And she's devastated at this image of like, look at this fox that's died. But in that moment, she she lays down with the fox and she she's thinking to herself, I think I might just die too. I think I'm going to go with this fox. What would it be like to just let myself rest eternally as this fox has done? And she 
in the last moments as she's thinking about her worth and how she can contribute to the the land, she decides to pick up this fox and carry it to the lake that maybe she can't save the world, but she can make a difference for this fox. She can make a difference for this one thing, this one creature. And she picks up this dead fox's body and she starts, her bones are old and creaking and she doesn't even know if she's going to make it because she's almost too late. She, her body is giving out. And she somehow gets herself to the lake, but the, it's too late because the dog is there. The dog is waiting and it's it's baring its teeth. It's growling at her and it's not going to let her pass. It's not going to let her get to the lake. And something happens where she's able to, the dog is able to step aside and allow her past and she goes into the lake and she dips her entire body with the fox in her arms into the lake and emerge again and she's whole and young and the fox is young and alive and she and the fox again are ready to go again, ready to have another life lived. And this is symbolic, just as the Christians use this time to think of austera, think of Easter and Christ's death and resurrection, that the stories of death and resurrection are far older than Christian tradition. We are um, constantly re-energized and the traumas and things we have happen in our lives they are like death. Winter and rest is a form of death. And if you're coming out of something very traumatic, something that broke you, something that absolutely devastated you, maybe it's a death that happened in your family, someone close to you. Maybe you lost someone. Maybe there's been a, an ending of a relationship. And maybe you've been struggling with addiction. Maybe you have a spouse that's struggling with addiction. There's some some traumatic moment that happens in your life, and it is like a egoic death. It's allowing a part of yourself to die. It might be the part of you that thought, nothing bad will ever happen to me because I'm going to make sure and control my life enough that I will never let something bad happen. And that bad thing that happened it ends up being your death, a sort of death that you have to go through. And then the cycle brings you back around again to rebirth. And spring is a reminder of that. It's a reminder that even if a part of you had to die for you to move forward, you are going to move forward. Let that part of you die so that the whole of you does not die. And spring will al- allow you to renew again, to resurrect, to rebirth into what is now moving forward, your new life. So there is so much more to go on about that, but I hope that gives you an understanding of how to utilize cycles in your life, how to see yourself in cycles. And if you're not sure what cycle you're in, that's what people like me are for. Find yourself a person like me, a healer, a a guide, a mentor, a, a life coach. There are a lot of people out there with the, it is their calling to be that for someone. And it doesn't mean they're any better or more wise than you. It just means that that is their predisposition to help you. I'm going to use this opportunity to to invite you to practice in the traditions of Ostera in Easter and to have a different kind of perception about it, that it's not just Christian-based about Jesus and and, and the resurrection, but that Easter can be a marking for you and what it means for your life. Maybe even writing down what is it that you are emerging from. What sort of death have you experienced in the last year or in the winter or any time really that you are ready to be reborn from? 
I have a question from a listener, and this one was a good question I really want to address really quick. I had a question come in that said, are these practices that you're talking about, are they safe for children? And my answer to that very simple short answer is yes. And my long answer is even better than that, I think they should be for children. (laughs) I actually started this journey when I sort of walked away from the theology and the structure of Mormonism. That was hard for me because Mormonism is very organized. They actually have books for families to follow along with the scriptures and the lessons and whatever it is that they're doing at church and do at home with your kids and family. And there's a part of me, the teacher part of me, that loves that. I love that structure. So when I started to walk away, knowing that that wasn't true and authentic for me, that the the doctrine of that tradition was not right for me, the thing I was most afraid of was, what am I going to teach my kids? How am I going to offer them values and spirituality without some kind of structure or guide? And that is when I found you know, the wheel of the year, pagan practices, Celtic practices, Gnostic Christianity, secular Buddhism. The more I grasped onto some values that I really wanted to teach my children, the more I was like, not only is this great for kids, but I wish I had had it as a kid. And I wish that all kids were being taught this way. Because whether you're a Christian or whether you're Mormon or whether you're anything, these values are universal. And basically, they're teaching you how to listen to your own intuition and your own heart and to claim and own your sovereignty over your life, which is something I want my kids to have more than anything. No matter what their spiritual beliefs are, I want my kids to know that they have the power. They have connection to the divine, to whatever higher power that they believe in. And I did come across a book that I absolutely love, and it helps teach kids. It's called Circle Round. So if you are looking for practices for kids specifically, uh, that's that's a good one. And I'll reference that later too. But absolutely, I have noticed that kids are far more receptive to some of these ideas that I'm teaching than even adults. And that's because they're not so set in their ways. I mean, when I'm teaching adults how to do magic, and I might even be you know, explaining to them how to create a spell, sometimes adults are like, oh, I actually used to do this when I was a kid. I used to like take leaves and sticks and pine cones and whatever I could find outside and I would put them in a bowl and I would mix them up and I would call it a potion. Well, that's already intuitively spell work. And we are just all returning back to what it is that we did when we were kids. So it's actually a lot easier to to be a witch when you pretend you're a kid. (laughs) So I invite all of you to try it. Just be a kid again. That's really all it takes. That's really all you're doing. And your inner child will love it anyway. They love that kind of stuff. So that's a great question. And hopefully I'll be able to address that even more as I go in future episodes, what I do with kids, what I do with my kids. But for now, because it's Ostara, please invite your kids to be working with the symbolisms of Easter. The dying of the eggs is just another invitation to talk about the magic of fertility, the magic of manifesting. And if you are from a Christian come from and you would like more of that, I highly recommend that you look up the story of Mary Magdalene when she goes to convince Tiberius Caesar about the resurrection. And he says something to her like, no way did a guy die and come back to life. That's as real as if that egg in your hand was red. And then how the story, the myth goes, is that she's holding an egg. And as he says that, it turns red. And I don't know if this connects to the Easter traditions, but I do love that story. And that's a great one to tell your kids as you're dying eggs. And you can refer to that story. So that's one that I love that comes from the Gnostic Gospels of the Gospel of Mary and the Gospel of Philip and Thomas. So tune in next week. We're going to do an episode on the cycles of healing, specifically about trauma in the body. So 
If you need a trigger warning ahead of time, we are going to talk about trauma, but we're going to talk about it in broad sense, what has to do with how we hold trauma in the body. And I can't wait for that episode because it's fascinating to me and it's super helpful for anybody to understand their body a little bit better. Please don't miss my next Healing Through Art workshop is on March 28th from 6 to 8 p.m. So if you live locally in Utah, anywhere in the Salt Lake Valley, it's worth coming over to South Jordan. That's where we do it. It is going to be an emotional process session. It's where we do a meditation, painting out shapes and colors, moving energy out of the body, and a little bit of guided journaling to help you with those cycles of emergence, confrontation, all of the cycles of healing are included in that workshop. So it's an amazing workshop and I would like to invite all of you to come and join me. And let me know if you're a listener when you come and sign up to come because I'd love to say hi. I am here to help you use magic in your everyday life to strengthen relationships, to heal, to prosper, and to thrive. If you would like more information on these and other subjects, Find me on my social media, Instagram at prism underscore healing. On Facebook, I'm Courtney Pearl or my Facebook page, Courtney Pearl's Prism Healing. Events for tarot for tips, healing through art, and my favorite for kids, Heart Smart Art, an immersive experience to raise emotional intelligence for children and adults. You can find all of those and register for them on my website at prism-healing.com. That is where you can book private sessions for healing, private card readings, and my blog has all of the resources for this episode and for all of my episodes. So take a look at my website. And on any of those platforms, if you would like to private message me some questions about magic, healing, energy, or even some personal questions about your life that you would like my insight on, please slide into my DMs and get me those questions and I will feature them as a future questions from a listener on episodes. Some things that I mentioned in today's episode, you can look up Mythic Moons of Avalon by Jenna Tellendry, Circle Round, Raising Children in the Goddess Tradition by Starhawk, Diane Baker, and Anne Hill. And I would like to give a special thanks to Jess Blaine and his team for producing and managing at Ride the Wave Media and all of the support at the Daybreak Business community. This time I'd like to give a special shout out to Fresh King Benjamin for support in helping me understand social media and giving me some tasks and getting me on track with all of that. I'd like to thank Daybreak Treasures Boutique for featuring me as an artist and for sponsoring my events. I hope to see you next time right here. Go do some magic, my witches and wizards. (laughs) 